I don't know nobody that's not trying to be happy or successful. If you're not trying to be those two things, something's seriously wrong. And you, you got to go get yourself some help. So where I started from was my father making $5 a day. I come from nothing. I had a severe stuttering problem throughout school. I flunked out of school. I'm on my third marriage. I lost everything I ever owned twice. I've been homeless and lived in a car for three years. We talking about next level? I'm finna show you how to get there. See, the cool thing about me is, I ain't got nothing to sell you. I ain't got nothing for you. I'm just gonna tell you how you can get to the next level. Now, I've been debating on how I was gonna do this, but I thought the best way to go about this is just tell you my story. And in my story, maybe you can see some of yourself. Listen, man, anybody can be successful, but you gotta understand something. It's hard. It's hard, man. You can take all the courses you want. It's hard. You can go down there to the church and hold your hands in a prayer circle. When you get through praying, it's gonna be hard. You go to school, you can get all the degrees you want. When you get them degrees and you hang them on the wall, if you wanna be successful, it's gonna be hard. It's hard being successful. That's the first thing you need to understand. Come to these seminars and have these people come out here, talk to you about success and everything, come out here and they do a nice job of it. But then you go back and think you got it. It's hard. I don't even know the speaker's name, but all these people that's up here, it was hard. That lady had the red dress on to get to where she at, it's hard. It's hard. Understand that it's hard, man. The first way to get focus is to find purpose. The way to find purpose is you must identify what it is that you have to be purposeful in. Right When you are struggling with what to do, who you are, what's your next move, you are in an identity crisis. You are struggling with just who you are. See, you have not discovered who you are. You have to discover who you are in order to move you forward. If no one ever gave you the directions, let me assume something. When you get up and you get up in the morning, you go get in the car or you walk out your door, you have a destination in mind. If you go outside with no destination, what do you do? You just, you wander around. Once you don't have a destination, you are going to wander around. You cannot get in your car without a destination. Where, did you, where do you drive? So you are in an identity crisis, the same thing I was in. So you have to find your purpose. So let me help you with this. If you are in this situation, the solution is the first thing. You have to do the thing that God gave you. You just have to identify your gift. That's the first thing. Until you do that, you can forget it. You'll never find your purpose. You'll never know your mission. You'll never know the reason. So I think we're in an identity crisis. I think you have to identify who you are and what your real gift is and pursue the gift. The Bible says your gift will make room for you, put you in the presence of great men. That's what your gift do. That's God. That ain't Steve. I'm telling you what God said. You ain't got to believe me. It's in your Bible. I'm just telling you the truth. I identified my gift. See, that's why when he said, Steve, you can sing. Whoa, hey, hold up, man. That's not what I do. I've identified my gift. I'm in a joke telling business. Your gift is like a tree trunk. Your gift is the trunk of a tree. On a tree, it has many branches. Now, because my gift is comedy, that's my tree trunk. That's what I was made for, the gift. Your, two things, your career is what you're paid for. Your calling 
is what you made for. So God took this tree trunk and made a lot of branches. Comedy made me a movie, a TV star, a radio star. Uh, I can write books. But then what he made me for was to motivate people to change people's lives by sending me through a process that was so hard for me to overcome when somebody like you stands up and asks me a question, I know the answer without even thinking because I've been processed. I've been, I've been homeless. So I know exactly what you're feeling. You feel me? Albert Einstein said that imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. That's what your imagination is. Your imagination is actually very, very real. Everything you imagine could be a preview to life's coming attraction. Everything we have today came from somebody's imagination. Somebody was talking on the phone with their cord on the wall and got sick of it and said, you know what, man, if I could just go outside and talk on the phone, ta-da, we got cell phones. <laughs> Somebody got tired of driving across the country and said, man, if I could fly over there, boom, we got airplanes. Imagination is everything. It's a preview to life's coming attractions. Everything you've ever imagined is real. See, I, I tell young people like this. First of all, this is how your imagination works. You got to grab this concept. It is impossible for you to think an impossible thought. That is impossible. You can't think something that ain't possible. You ain't that smart. <laughs> so if it's in your head, you got to ask yourself, how did it get there? That's God showing you a preview of a coming attraction he has for you. The problem with most people is you think your imagination is hocus pocus. It's really not. It's a preview of a coming attraction. If you react to your imagination, that's where your real life is. It's just God showing you what he has for you. It's the problem people have is they tell their imagination to the wrong people. As a kid, you know, I, I didn't know, but my, my gift is that I found out later on, I have the ability to think extremely quick and I can take any piece of information and transpose it into comedy immediately. Now, when you're a kid and you don't understand that, you get in a lot of trouble. I stayed in a lot of trouble. I've been to more principal office than all of y'all put together and the pastor's office at the church because I just couldn't control it. It just, I thought something and I fired it off and it was instant and it happened. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't know what it was until I got older, that this was a gift, that, that it, it did make room for me, that I became a stand-up comedian, which started with a dream of mine and it led to where I am today. It's a lot of stuff that happened in between there. But your gift is the thing that you do the absolute best with the least amount of effort. That's your God-given gift, and everybody has one, and God gives it to you at birth. You don't have to go anywhere to discover it. It's not in the water. It's not on the mountaintop. It ain't hid under a rock. Your God-given gift is instilled in you at birth. If you pursue that as opposed to your passion, there lies your greatest chance for success. The problem with people is we don't, we, don't, we don't pursue our gift oftentimes. We try to go get an education and make it think that's going to get us somewhere. And then we try to pursue a passion. And, you know, I'm passionate about golf. I really am. I'm passionate about golf. But I need two dozen balls when I start around <laughs> the golf because as passionate as I am, I'm not gifted at it. I make some good shots, you know, I hit one every now and then, get up there, you know, green in regulation, but for the most part, you know, I got to go find that ball somewhere. <laughs> and uh, I'm passionate about it, but I'm not gifted at it. If you, if you identify that gift, man, that gift is the thing that, that can make you great. Your gift will make room for you. Now, what is your gift? It's the thing that you do the absolute best with the least amount of effort. That's your gift. Quit running away from the gift. Your gift will make room for you. Stop trying to be something you ain't gifted at.
Nobody asks you to go down here and study to be a dentist, and you ain't really good at that. Quit going down to the church trying to sing. You can't sing. <laughs> now, just because they let you sing at the church, you're not finna, ain't nobody else finna go with this. Because, you know, come as you are, the Lord loveth the cheerful, give all that. We don't apply scriptures out here. You come to the Apollo and you can't sing, we got something for your ass up there. <laughs> Period. Listen to me. All of you have this gift. Identify it. It's the thing that you do the absolute best with the least amount of effort. That's what you should be doing. You're wasting your time pursuing your passion. The Bible does not mention passion. It mentions your gift. What are you gifted at and do that? Stop tripping. You can do that. If you fry chicken better than everybody you know, you ought to be somewhere frying chicken. People make millions of dollars frying chicken. Popeyes, Kentucky Fried Chicken, El Pollo Loco. All they doing is making chicken. They just found a way to do it. Somebody just started making chicken. You know the story of Marie Callender's? Do you know what this woman did, man? She worked for a diner, a greasy spoon diner that was going out of business. It was her only job. She was a single mother. It was her only job. She needed that job, but the diner was going to close. So she went to the owner of the diner and said, let me bake one of my pies, people like my pies, and see if I can help you make a little money. He said, whatever, bring it in. He, she brought one pie in. They sold every slice. The next day, the people came in and asked for the pie. She had to go home and make another pie. The next day, so many people asked for the pie, she had to make four pies. Then people started saying, can I buy my own pie? She made so many pies at this store that she eventually saved her money and put a commercial oven in her house. Now all, she done made so many pies, the dude's shop, he ain't selling hamburger no more. All he's selling is them damn pies. That's how Marie Callender got started. Marie Callender now has over 120 restaurants. You can't go to no frozen food section without seeing Marie Callender in there. You know what she started with? A pie. One pie. The dude that when I had hair, when I had that world famous lining with that box cut when I was Steve Hightower, Kings of Comedy, when I had that hair, the dude that cut my hair, I met him in 1986. He cut my hair for $10. I remembered him. When I got on TV, I had I hired him. He came out there, he started making $300 a haircut. I paid him 10. He had been with me so many years that he was making $1,500 per haircut. I was getting my hair cut four times a week for television and touring. I paid him $1,500 each time. He was making $6,000 a week. You know what he was doing? Cutting hair. That same haircut I paid $10 for in 87, this dude was cutting it now for me for $1,500. I cut my hair off. He, he, <laughs> we had to put him on suicide watch for a little while. But then let me tell you what he did. I paid him a chunk of money for being with me all these years. Gave him a severance pay. Told him good luck. Guess what this dude got now? He got four salons and he owned two barber colleges. You know what this dude make now? 3.6 million a year. You know what he do? He cut hair. He cut hair. He don't do nothing else. That's his gift. Friend of mine we grew up with, all he did was cut grass. He had a single blade lawnmower that he pushed. He was so good at it, he could raise the blades up and lower them. He could cut patterns in your grass. We little, I'm going, hey man, we going swimming. Now nah, I got to cut Miss Jackson grass. He could cut patterns in your yard. He could put your initials in your grass as a little boy. $2 for the front, $2 for the back. $4. We used to laugh at him all the time. Well, let me tell you what we laughing at now. 
He got a landscaping company in Cleveland. You know how much this boy making? Four million dollars a year. You know what he do? He cut grass. He got 38 trucks. He got all the contracts in the city, malls, corporations. And when it snow outside, he do such a good job cutting the grass, he put plows on the front of his trucks and he got all the snow removal contracts. This boy making four million dollars a year and you know what he do? He cut grass. I don't have a relationship with God because I'm afraid of burning in hell. I have a relationship with God because he helps me in my day-to-day -day living. I have a relationship with God because there, if there is an eternal place to go live, I want to go see it. I figure, you know, as long as I ain't trying to step on nobody to get to where I'm going, Look, you all gonna make mistakes. Everybody's a sinner in here. Everybody in here broken. Everybody need help. I need help. I'm broken. You need God fixing you some kind of way. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much money you got. You need God. But well, listen to me. Don't you understand that that's okay? It's all right to have a relationship with God. Having a relationship with God is really cool. And you're looking at a street dude telling you this. But he changed people, you know. God changed people. If you followed my career any length of time, from the time I was back on the Steve Harvey show, all the way up through the Kings of Comedy, all the way up to 2005, you saw what my life was. But after 2005, he came and he got me, though. Because he got sick of me. And I got sick of me. See, you know what happened to me in 2005? I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. I was so sick of me. You know, y'all saw me on TV, y'all saw this money I was making. I was miserable, man. I was at my unhappiest point in life all the way up to 2005. I was miserable. These kings of comedy, the only time I had a good time was when I was on stage. The only time I had a good time, I was in front of the camera. I was with Sid and the boys, we was performing. When I got off that stage, my life was miserable, man. I was in a pain you would not believe. I was in an abyss, man. I was in a dark place. How, how in the world did I get here? I got here cause of God's grace. My plight had overtaken me and I was about done. But right when you think you about done, don't they always show up? Can you name me one single thing God ain't brought you through? Can you name it? If he ain't brought you through it, he's currently pulling you through it right now. And you know how I know that's real? Because you're sitting in here. The God I serve you can't put no limitations on him. If you just get out the way, he can show you something. He do miraculous things all the time. Why would you not want one of them miracles to happen for you? I'm sitting here for me to be here today. The dude that I was, it's a miracle. We pray little prayers. We pray stuff that we see a way to get. You, you're supposed to pray for stuff you can't see no way how you can get it. God is in the make your dream come true business. God is in the get your life together business. God is in the forgiving business. Don't let nobody fool you, man. Don't let nobody fool you. Don't forget to pray. Don't be ashamed to pray. And don't ever be too proud to pray. Because prayer, prayer changes things. Prayer changes people too. I was talking to my trainer the other day. We were working out in my backyard. And he was wearing my out man and I sat down on the wall and I said man I'm struggling today this is hard and my trainer's a younger guy and he said what do you mean I said man this workout is hard he said no man this is hard he said how you came from a poor kid in the projects to this house you got in this neighborhood and the TV star he said that's hard and I had to catch myself because working out ain't near as hard as the struggle to get where you want. 
Everybody in this room wants two things. Everybody wants to be successful and everybody want to be happy. I'm going to tell you something about that. That that happiness and success is available for every last one of you. But I'm going to tell you what you're going to have to do. You got to change your mindset. If you're planning on being successful, you have to change this here. The difference between successful people and non-successful people is right here. It ain't no difference. It ain't none. I ain't got no more than none of y'all got. God gave me the same thing he gave y'all. God loved me the same as he loved all y'all. He don't love me more than he loved you. But you have got to change your mindset. You got to get funky if you want to be successful. If you think that they're going to mail this money to your house, you're dead wrong about that. If you think they're going to pave the way for you and make it easy, you're dead wrong about that. If you want to be successful, you got to change your mind and you're going to have to have some faith. And grow your wings on the way down. See, the people that will live their dreams, the 2% that will do that, these are, and write this down, become a risk taker. They're risk takers. They don't mind failing. They don't mind making mistakes. They're willing to take life on, take life in the collar. This God said, if you're not willing to risk, you cannot grow. And if you cannot grow, you cannot become your best. And if you cannot become your best, you can't be happy. And if you can't be happy, then what else is there? I like what Helen Keller said. She said, life is short and unpredictable. Eat the dessert first. Here's something else. Write this down. Make it important to become financially independent. You know, people say money won't make you happy, but everybody want to find out for themselves. If you look at yourselves, make it important that you find some way to use your talents and gifts to generate the income that allow you to control your destiny. I read something that said, either you control your destiny or someone else will. You have got to make some decisions in your life but you got to tie it to this gift. Your gift is the thing that you do the absolute best with the least amount of effort. That's your God-given gift. He didn't hide it from you. He didn't put it under the rocks. He didn't hide it in the ocean. It, it ain't on, it, 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 you don't need no map to find it. God put it right here when he made you. All y'all are gifted at something. The Bible says your gift will make room for you and put you in the presence of great men. That's a scripture, that ain't a theory of mine. See, I ain't got but one gift. I have the ability to take information and transpose it into comedy immediately. I don't even have to think about it. I don't even have to, it's just what I do. I dealt with people with multiple personality disorders, 52 different personalities and how to put them back together. And I dealt with people with no personality who have a much bigger problem. No matter what the diversity of people I've dealt with and the diversity you've seen in this show, the ultimate question I'm always asking is, how do I help people to break through? The question is, what are you breaking through to? In essence, all of us at some level to feel alive have to always feel like we're growing. When people ask me, what does it take to be happy? I always tell them one word, progress. Progress equals happiness. Even if you're not where you want to be yet, if you're on the road, if you're improving, if you're making progress, you're going to love it. You're going to feel alive. On the other hand, it doesn't matter how successful you are. If you stop growing, you start dying inside. Now, how does this relate to this session on Breakthrough? Well, I'll say it's really simple. If you and I want to know what it takes to be happy, we have to understand what is our current blueprint of how our life's supposed to be. Now, what do I mean by blueprint? Well, we have a story in our head of how life's supposed to be. Some people's story is you work hard in school, you become really great, you're a nice person, you're a good person, and then you grow up and you take care of yourself and you find the ideal man and you fall in love and you have a white picket fence and you have three perfect children and you live happily ever after. Somebody else's story, the old story was you work really hard in school, you excel in college, you go to work for a big corporation and you move up through the ranks until you're the president or chairman of the company and you become successful and respected throughout life. These are some old stories. Obviously, the stories that we hear today of what people's lives are supposed to be like are completely diverse. We no longer have these little archetypes, but one archetype still seems to remain. And that archetype is, in order for you to really feel like you're enough, many people believe they have to achieve an enormous amount. They may, may do it in different ways. They may do it by building a company and taking it public 
when they're 27 or 25 years old or you know they find and create a new technology or they become a very special doctor but we live in a culture in the west that teaches people that you're not enough unless you do something really special and unique and we define special and unique in interesting ways so you got to make it important to take care of yourself put that at the top of the list because you can't do well you can't do good work if you don't feel good we don't want to be like the man who said uh, if I'd known I'd lived this long, I'd have taken better care of myself. Here's something else. Repeat after me, please. OQP. Only quality people. Yes. Look at your relationships and ask yourself the question. Jim Rohn would ask this question. What is this relationship doing to me? Sidney Poitier wrote a book called The Measure of a Man. I love the taste because I love his voice. He said, when you go for a walk with someone, Something happens without being spoken. He said, either you adjust, adjust to their pace or they adjust to your pace. Whose pace have you adjusted to? MIT did a study, and the study indicated that you earned within two to $3,000 of your, your closest friends and associates earn. Who's impacting you? Who's in your ear? What influence do they have on you? Dr. Dennis Kimbrough said, if you're the smartest one in your group, you need to get a new group. So practice the principle of OQP, only quality people. And somebody's saying, Les, can I change them? No, it's a full-time job changing yourself. Some people are so negative, they'll walk into a dark room and begin to develop. My family members and friends call me crazy for going to seminars, spending money on books and tapes and going to seminars. When are you going to stop going? I said, when I die. See, if you and I from this day forward are going to be happy, just remember what we've said. It takes two things, grow and give. A meaningful life comes from growing, that sense of progress, and it comes from having life not just be about me, but about we. Doing something that makes me feel connected to other people besides myself. That growth, that sense of contribution fills a deep spiritual need that we all have. If you are unhappy in your life, you got three choices, really two. Blame, that's not a choice, it's not gonna work. Don't blame someone else, don't blame the event, don't blame yourself, just figure out what you're gonna do to change your life. That's my specialty. If you like my coaching or my team's coaching, come visit with us, come to an event, come get a coach, come through a program and we'll guide you through it more than just a few minutes like this and we'll do it directly, an environment that'll shift you or change your blueprint. You're gonna to have to rewire what's going on inside and that's what we focus on as well. So I hope this journey has been an interesting one for you. I hope it's opened up your eyes to what it takes to go from where you are to where you wanna be. It takes changing your emotional pattern. It changes bringing presence to your life. It takes realizing you have no problems compared to somebody else and putting your life in perspective. It takes the ability to deal with those extreme stresses that happen in your life by questioning your limiting beliefs. And again, if we'd love to coach you and show you how to change those in a permanent way where it happens automatically, just like lifting weights so often until the muscle is always there and you find yourself able to follow through. It takes for you to be able to figure out how to deal with crisis and how to turn it around. It takes facing your fear. It takes pushing yourself through what used to stop you. It takes putting yourself in a position where you connect to what's more important than just yourself, what you value than just yourself. And it takes, I think in this case also, the ability to realize that no matter what happens to you, you're more than that moment. You're more than the story you think you're supposed to be. And that even when you're not matching what you think you need to be, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe you're having to find a different part of yourself that's gonna fulfill you at a much deeper level. Sometimes failing to get your goal gives you your destiny. I can't tell you how many people I've known over the years who had an idea of what they thought their life was supposed to be like and they didn't achieve it and they felt miserable and upset and frustrated and one day an opening happened and they went, oh my God, thank God that didn't happen. I think it's Garth Brooks had a great song and it's a song about when he was in high school and he was in love with this girl, infatuated with her and she didn't even know that he existed. And he prayed to God every day that she would notice him, that she would fall in love with him. 
And then, sure enough, she never did. He was so disappointed. His blueprint didn't match. His life didn't match it because she didn't even know he existed. And he felt this suffering. He could do nothing to turn it around. Well, 15 years later, he became a guy named Garth Brooks, somebody everybody knew. And he could rock, you know, stadiums with his energy and his song and his music. And he goes back to be at his high school reunion. I think it was his 15-year reunion, if I remember correctly. I don't remember the exact year. But all I remember is... He said he saw that woman that he was so obsessed by. He was looking forward to seeing her. And now he was Garth Brooks, and he met her. And after he met her and spent some time with her, he wrote a song called, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. <laughs> Sometimes not getting your blueprints the best thing that ever happened because the disappointment drives you to find something more important inside of you. Or not getting it makes you look for another aspect of your life, a spiritual aspect, a, a family aspect, a physical aspect. If you can just trust that life doesn't happen to you, it happens for you, then you can find in any situation a benefit that can take your life to the next level. I don't care if you're Frank and Kristen, I don't care if you're you know, Mandy and Scott, I don't care if you're Joaquin and Kim, every one of us in our life is gonna face situations where it feels like we have total trauma, something that's been taken from us. The real question is, what are you gonna do with it? Some people just live in their story of what they don't have, and they have the right to do that. If Frank and Kristen lived in pain and felt bad, we'd all say they have the right to do it. It's the difference between what you have the right to do and what you deserve to give yourself and others. We have the ability to transcend whatever happens to us. There's something called post-traumatic growth. Very few people know about it. Two people go through the same stress, one's destroyed, the other grows. What's the difference? The people that grow will not give up they don't have any excuses. They find the way to break through whatever it takes. And when they do, three things happen. Number one, they realize who they really are and what they're capable of. They realize they're so much stronger than they thought they were. And number two, they deepen all their relationships. You want to know who really cares about you, who you love and who loves you? Go through some tragedy. Go through some hard times. All your Facebook friends go away. Your real friends, your real family shows up for you and you show up for them and it deepens your relationships. And the third thing happens, if you can push yourself through and break through whatever challenges life gives you, is each time you have a breakthrough, you get stronger. And it almost like builds a psychological immunity in you, where suddenly, all of a sudden, it's like stuff happens, you know stuff's gonna happen, and you're not scared of it anymore. Because after you've been through a stroke, after you've been through you know, losing the use of some of your body, your senses, after you lose a family member, and you break through to that, you get to the other side, it's like, give me your best shot, life. It's almost like there's this psychological immunity that says, I'm ready for whatever life will give me. I don't want challenges, but if they're here, I know I can handle them. That strength of spirit is what creates a sense of freedom and joy in life. And that strength of spirit basically comes from living a life where you are constantly and never ending filling your way to improve yourself and to help others. That's my mission. And if we can serve you again in the future, I hope you'll check us out. There's three ways you can continue to participate with us. You can come to an event, come have an experience with us live at a weekend at our Unleash the Power Within or our Date with Destinies. I think you'll find it's very different than just sitting here talking to you quietly sitting in front of your computer screen. It's a rock and roll environment. It's like going to the ballpark and having one person sitting there talking to you versus being in the ballpark of the rock and roll concert, you know, with 50,000. There's an energy and a power that comes from it. Second is there's immersion. Here we talk for an hour, there's distractions and emails, there it's total focus, and we go for immersion. We're literally, what we did here over six weeks, a few little conversations, all that happens over and over again, multiple times a day, and you get that shift. So come to an event, or call up and get a coach. We have people that you can work with and have a free coaching session and make sure it's really valuable for you. But these are people that can check in with you to help make sure you break through, you make the changes you want to make in your career or your finances or your body or your emotions or whatever area matters to you. And finally, lastly, and probably most importantly, every day you got to feed your mind. Because every day most of us are turning on, you know, some form of news. It shows up in our pocket and our Blackberries or I, you know, iPods or iPhones, I should say. It shows up on, you know, on your computer constantly. It chases us and it rarely does a good idea interrupt you. Really what you have to do is pursue the ideas, pursue the experiences that are going to change your life. And we have a way to do it called net time, no extra time. 
a way where you can keep feeding your mind the stuff that really matters with some products or services. So if you're interested in any of those things, be sure to click on your interest of an event or interest in having a free coaching session, or maybe try one of our audio programs because the other challenge here is with video, you got to sit here potentially and watch me, but with audio, you can do it while you're working out, you can do it while you're cleaning the house, you can do it while you're driving in the car, or you're getting to work. We'd love to continue serving you in any way we can. I know I've gone long in this session, but I really want you to think about how can I get my life the way I want it to be? The way I do it is I figure out what my blueprint is and I update it for what life is. I change my life, match my blueprint, and suddenly my life feels full and alive. Thank you for the time that we spent together here. I've really enjoyed our time. And I hope that this breakthrough series reminds you to never settle for less than you can be. Never settle for less than you can give or you can share. Live strong, live with passion, and God bless. My son, John Leslie, poses a question. He said, when you have goals and dreams you want to achieve, he said, ask yourself the question, who should I count on and who should I count out? And so many people never achieve their goals because they have too many toxic, negative, energy draining people in their lives. And you have to have goals outside of your comfort zone that will challenge you because in order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone you've never been. And you've got to have a mentor who's experienced, who, who's been there, done that. And, and as a result of that relationship, because you can't see the picture when you're in the frame, Muhammad Ali said, I'm the greatest, but he never won a championship without Angelo Dundee. And Michael Jordan never won a championship without Phil Jackson. So you've got to have someone that can see something in you that you can't see that 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 can take you to a place within yourself that you can't go by yourself so i would teach them the value of having a, a life code that life is an adventure and it's going to be a challenge and get ready to, because you're going to fail your way to success you're going to get slapped around by life and don't spend time complaining about it and telling everybody 80 percent don't care and 20 percent glad it's you <laughs> Dr. Alfred Golson, uh, who has since passed, was a very unusual guy. And he told me, he said, Mr. Brown, you have cancer. I said, can you give me a second opinion? He said, yes, and you're ugly too. <laughs> I said, oh my God. <laughs> so I didn't have a chance to, to, to have fear because you know, those three words, you have cancer, three of the most feared words in seven different languages i saw it as a fight and 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 from that time to this time you know my psa was 2400 mass central prostate specific antigen and and now it's below zero and metastasized the seven areas of my body which was a good thing because seven is my lucky number <laughs> okay so it no I, I i never was fearful that i was going to die from it and and i think if i read something by dr norman cousins he wrote a book called the biology of hope and he talked about the fact that when something happens to you, you don't deny it, you defy it. And I was defiant. That I'm going to beat this. I'm going to handle this. That there are people who many times when something happens to them, that they embrace it from a place of fear and it takes them out. And Elsie Robinson said, things may happen to you and things may happen around you, but the most important things are the things that happen in you. And you have to stand up inside yourself and deal with it and handle it. So fortunately, that never bothered me, but I had Sadika pain. That had me speaking in unknown tongues. <laughs> and I was in a wheelchair for several months, speaking from a, wheel, a wheelchair. And it was something that I, I dealt with that frightened me. Will this ever end? It was 24 hours. I lost a lot of sleep. It was exhausting going from all types of specialists in and out of the country. And just one day, it stopped. And I'm glad that I'm past that, you know. I just, I, I feel like uh, uh, when, you, when you go through some stuff, you just, some certain things 
that you don't want ever to see again, and that's what I want to ever see again. But fear has not been the biggest challenge that I've faced with the things that I've been dealing with in terms of my health. Well, talk to me about the process that you go through mentally. So there have been a few times in your life in getting to know your story where it seemed like really key inflection points, um, being told that you were teachable but mentally retarded, that for sure is something that would define most people and they would have a hard time escaping that. Um, being told that you have cancer, that it's stage four, that um, they don't know how to treat it, like that's something that consumes most people. How do you build that resilience? So maybe by the time you get to cancer, you've already done so much work, so I get maybe how that one, you're, you're protected by the mechanisms you've built, but in the beginning, how did you crawl out from under the labels that people were putting on you? The easiest thing I've done was to get out from under the labels and to live the life that I live. The most difficult thing I've ever done was to believe that I can do it. What's the difference? Uh, the difference is that when you don't know what's impacting you, and it's it's something that that's holding you down and you're not aware of it. Um, the great anthropologist Margaret Mead was in a restaurant in London, and and a guy was serving her and said, "There's several Americans here tonight." And she said, "Is that right? Yeah. So let me know when you serve the dessert. I'll tell you exactly how many are here." He said, "Oh, you couldn't possibly." And so he came back and said, "Okay, I've done it." And she got up. She walked around. And she came back and she said, there are around 25 here. And he looked at the roster. How did you know that? Say, so in America, we eat differently from you when we eat a dessert. You eat it from the crust toward the tip. We eat it from the tip toward the crust. When you eat a slice of pie, how do you eat yours? Uh, definitely, yeah, from the, the tip back to the crust, for sure. Yeah, okay, and so, so there are things that when you, in, in my situation, when you live in a dominant culture that is designed to destroy your sense of self and your belief in yourself, and, and you have to learn ways in which you can begin to connect with this power that you have within yourself to handle where you are. The key is to be constantly in a perpetual process discovering the truth of who you are and fighting constantly to look for ways in which you can escape the inner conversation. I speak to audiences around the world and I, and I train speakers as well and I, I tell them that when you speak that there's, a, there's an objective that you want to achieve when you speak to an audience because how people live their lives is a result of the story they believe about themselves. So you as a speaker, when you speak in this program, when people see you, what you do is distract, dispute, and inspire. You distract people from their current story with your guests and the questions that you asked through the process of the ongoing questioning and the way in which they respond and the things they have learned, you dismantle their current belief system and inspire them to, to create a new chapter with their lives. And so, but that's an ongoing process of, of constantly interrupting that conversation, what psychologists call your self-explanatory style, because life is, is going to beat up on you in so many ways and many things, they come back, you know, negative thoughts and, and how you feel about yourself, they don't die. They, they come back once you stop doing the maintenance work on your mind, listening to motivational messages, going to seminars and workshops, spending time quietly listening to the still small voice within. Uh, who am I really? Is this really me? Am I giving my best? Uh, am I just reflecting what's around me? Because all of these various things affect how we show up in life. And so having a strategy to continuously find ourselves reaching higher. Robert Schuller had a book, it's not very popular, but I loved it. It's called Peak to Peak, U-P-E-A-K to P-E-E-K. Because you're constantly reaching higher to find out, discover your, your better self. 
This is a time where you have to be hungry. <laughs> because the over, according to the Department of Labor, over 20,000 people lose their jobs every month and being replaced by artificial intelligence. And so I used to sell television sets. A guy named Sam Maxerod, not going to do it. Hello. Hi, would you like to buy a good working television set? Nobody down. And they, they said, no, you're going from door to door. And, and he would call the guys together when it gets so late and say, okay, we got to go. And he would call everybody to the car. And he said, wait a minute, come here. Hey, Leslie's out here. And, and I can hear him saying, hey, Leslie, come on, come on to the car. And I said, no, Sam, why not? I said, I'm not going to stop until I sell a television set. I haven't sold yet. No, nobody's sold anything yet. I don't care, Sam. I've got to do this. I made a commitment. I'm going to make enough money to put groceries on our table. And, and I would knock sometimes 10, 30 at night and hey, would you like to buy a nice working television set? No money down. Do you know what time it is? Yes, I do. I'm going to buy groceries for our family. Somebody's going to buy a nice working television set from me tonight, and it might as well be you. And they say, come on in here, fool. It better be a good one. <laughs> so I learned how to be unstoppable. When he came to pick the other guys up, we had to wait till they got dressed. But I would be standing out front looking for him, waiting, because I was hungry. They were getting money just to have a good time to party on the weekend. I was earning money so that we could eat.